Okay, okay, okay. Are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> Carry on. So uh, uh, yesterday uh, we were talking about uh, the various kinds of joy that is uh, available, if you like, on the path and how much of the Buddhist path is about joy, happiness, tranquility, all these very positive feelings. Uh, and in fact, you could say that the enlightenment experience the very idea of insight, the very idea of the end of the Buddhist path uh, depends on happiness. Uh, yeah, you have to have happiness for this path to actually work. The idea of samadhi, the idea of stilling the mind, the idea of uh, getting unity of the mind, this also depends on happiness. Uh, in the suttas it has, says, Sukkino chittang samadhiyati. Uh, Sukkino chittang samid, sam, samadhiyati means that uh, uh, the mind of a happy person uh, is still there. Uh, yeah, stillness comes from happiness. Uh, and the reason for that is very simple. The reason is because uh, uh, it, when the mind is happy, uh, when you're feeling joy, uh, then automatically the mind goes towards the object. It goes towards the happiness. Uh, and it's very easy to be peaceful. Uh, but if you have dukkha in your mind or dukkha in your body or dukkha anywhere, uh, then the mind doesn't want to be there anymore. The mind wants to rebel, the mind wants to go somewhere else, yeah? So it is this natural inclination of the mind. Uh, whenever you're happy, it goes towards the object, it goes towards unity, because it wants to stay with what is happening here. Uh, it's kind of just natural psychology, really, when you think about it. Uh, and this is why it is important not to have too much uh, uh, suffering, and it's important to build up and learn how to find that happiness in your meditation uh, you will notice every time I give the guided meditation, it is about, you know, a large part of it is about enjoying what you're doing, yeah? enjoying the peace, enjoying the tranquility, enjoying the good friendship, enjoying the fact that the Buddha is available, his teachings are still around, yeah? all of these positive qualities, yeah? because that is what enables the mind to be in the present. Yeah? Mindfulness becomes possible when the present moment is joy happy. Yeah, uh, Like the old saying, the... Uh, and make the present moment the, make the present moment a pleasant moment uh, yeah because when the present moment is pleasant you want to be here you don't want to escape anywhere else this is basic psychology huh? and if you experience dukkha this is why i try to avoid dukkha in the body because it just makes it much more difficult to be mindful also makes it more difficult to uh, be still and to follow the object and to attain samadhi and all of these things are really out of reach because of that uh, and so for this reason, one of the things you will find in the suttas is that the Buddha actually specifically teaches us meditations, a way of reflection uh, to give rise to joy. Yeah? And uh, so this is kind of fascinating. And these teachings are usually called the anusatis. Anusati means like to recollect or to reflect on or to recall. Especially it means recollection. Yeah? In other words, the memory of something. Yeah? Yeah? The idea of bringing to mind something. Yeah? And often that is about past things, uh, and sometimes it is just the qualities of uh, like the Buddha or something like that. Uh. And so the sutta we're going to look at now is precisely about how to give rise to joy and happiness in uh, at any time really, but specifically of course in the connection with meditation practice. Uh. And there are six ways according to the sutta that uh, we can give rise to joy. The first one is the recollection of the Buddha, yeah, learning how to remember the Buddha in the right way. And then you have the recollection of the Dharma, then the uh, recollection of the Sangha, and then you have the recollection of your good conduct, yeah, the Sila Nusati, the Buddha Nusati, Dhamma Nusati, Sangha Nusati, Sila Nusati, and then you have the recollection of your generosity, the Chaga Nusati, Chaga Nusati, and then you have the recollection of the Devatas, the Devata Nusati. Huh? That's kind of an interesting the recollection of the Devatas. Huh? So we're going to have a look at each one of these six. And uh, as so often in the suttas, uh, there is uh, always a little bit of a hierarchy. Yeah? And the hierarchy here is that uh, the Buddha always comes first. Uh, and this is what you see throughout the suttas. And yeah, the Buddha arises in the world, and the Buddha arising in the world is the beginning of everything. That starts everything out. Uh, and so if you have confidence in the Buddha, and faith in the Buddha, and you're able to recollect the qualities of the Buddha, then you are kind of recollecting what is at the foundation of Buddhism. And this is why this is the most powerful kind of recollection, because it encompasses everything else, if you understand what the Buddha is. 
And so this is the most powerful in many ways, and it's also perhaps in some ways not so easy. Yeah. Yeah, you try to recall the Buddha and you wonder what, you know, you kind of can't really make head nor tail maybe of it. Uh, well, you can probably can make a little bit of it, but not enough maybe to give rise to much joy. Yeah. And so you have these other opportunities instead. The Dhamma, the Dhamma is more tangible than the Buddha because the Dhamma is the present. Yeah, we have the suttas. Uh, the Sangha, perhaps more tangible. Or maybe not. It's hard to know with the Sangha. Because uh, as we will talk about the Sangha, it is about the Arya Sangha, the noble Sangha. And who is the Arya Sangha? Not easy to know. Yeah? Maybe you think you know, but maybe you're wrong. Yeah? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, because often we think we know who are the Arahants in the world. Oh, this monk is an Arahant. I always hear people say these things. And I want to ask them, how do you know? Man? Because other people say, well, do they know? Man? <laughs> you know, it's one of these things we tend to be, be like sheep. Everyone says this monk is an arahant, and then they say, "Oh, if you say that that monk is not an arahant, then it's bad karma." Right? So everyone says it's an arahant because they're afraid of making bad karma. And this is how you get everyone being a sheep, and no one thinking for themselves. So this is what the outcome of this kind of thinking. Yeah. And then there is the recollection of uh, uh, your sila, yeah, your good actions. This is becoming even more tangible, uh, even more clear what you have to do. Uh, and then your generosity, and you notice that generosity is a specific kind of recollection. This gives you an idea why generosity, chaga, is so important on the Buddhist path. And I may talk a bit more about this later on. And then the last one, which is kind of nice, the idea of the devatas, the devata anusati, recollection of these divine beings who obviously have lived a good life, and now you are living in the same way. You can kind of compare yourself to the devatas. So everyone here is like a little deva. Is that kind of nice thought? Uh, we're like a little deva. Uh, and we're head, heading towards that. Uh, yeah? uh, I think that's kind of cute thought. The devas are very beautiful and powerful and nice beings. Also good quality. There's a nice comparison in a sense. Uh. So um, let us look at this sutta. Please don't read too much while I'm, while I'm explaining because you know, often it's just distraction. This is one of the reasons I don't like this board so much because I know that when you put something on the board, everyone is reading here. Yeah? And so your attention gets divided, right? And then you kind of don't get this, nor do you get the other, and you kind of get really confused. And there's some interesting research on that, uh, that uh, PowerPoint. Uh, all right. Yeah, I was just saying about this research that was done about uh, lectures that are given. And if you have a lecture and you use PowerPoint, then people's attention is always divided, uh, and people always learn less. That's kind of the... the <laughs> The kind of the outcome of these things, uh, and it's kind of fascinating because, uh, and still, I, maybe I shouldn't use it at all. Maybe I should just kind of uh, disconnect the computer, throw the computer in the garbage, get rid of. And maybe that would be to the benefit of everyone, including myself, if we did that. Uh, <laughs> that's a nice Thai saying in Thailand. They say "high tech, high took." <laughs> took is like uh, dukkha in Thai, yeah. so high tech, high took. Yeah. I think there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, so anyway, so we're going to look at this Mahanama Sutta, and eventually when the internet comes back, yeah, we will do that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I will just talk a little bit about the Mahanama Sutta. So, um, uh, so this is in the Anguttara Nikaya. Oh, there it is. Oh, it's, of course, it's saying it's in there, so it's not on the internet. That's true. Okay, so no worries in that case. We'll just, uh, so this Sutta is uh, with Mahanama, and uh, Mahanama is, is a cousin of the Buddha, uh, and he is a brother of Anuruddha. And so Mahanama goes to the Buddha. Uh, so he, we have here the introduction. He had one time the Buddha was staying in the land of the Sakyan. So this is his family, his extended family, near Kapilavatu in the Banyan Tree Monastery, the Nigroda Rama, which was the monastery where he was staying there. Uh, then Mahanama, the Sakyan, went up to the Buddha, bowed, sat down to one side, and said to him, uh, yeah. Anyway, so okay, so they, here we have Mahanama the Sakyan, and he goes to the Buddha, and they have a conversation. And this conversation is about these six recollections that I just mentioned. And uh, there is a nice story. You know, someone said the other day, oh, that was Billy. Billy said the other day we should have a, a, a special session just on the Vinaya Pitika. And one of the stories of the Vinaya Pitika is the story of Mahanama and Aruda. You know that story? Yeah. <laughs> Some of you know that story because you've probably heard me tell this story before. 
And uh, this is a story of what spe specifically when the Buddha comes back to the Sakyans. Yeah, the Buddha comes back and everyone recognizes that one of their family members has kind of turned out to what happened to our family member. Wow, look at that. <laughs> this kind of turned out to some other kind of being, yeah, become the Buddha or whatever. Yeah. And so there, many of them are very inspired by this. Yeah, I guess the initial shock of having your family member become the Buddha is kind of probably quite large. Imagine if you had a family member who became the Buddha. What, what would you say if it comes back? And they, they say, oh, I'm the Buddha. What would you say? <laughs> you, you might say you kind of lose your bearings a little bit if that happened. Uh, but after a while, you kind of recognize it. Yeah? And then uh, they become very inspired. And so every family of the Sakyans, uh, they say that one, one person, our family should go forth. Yeah? It should become a monk or a, maybe a nun later on or whatever. Uh, and so in the family of Mahanama and Anuruddha, because they were brothers, uh, Mahanama was thinking, yeah, well, actually, all the other families, one person has gone forth, but not in our family. Either Anuruddha or I should go forth, uh, yeah, become a monk. Yeah. And so he goes to Anuruddha and he says to Anuruddha, well, you know, one of us should go forth. You know, why don't you go forth? Uh, and Anuruddha says, no, you know, I have been brought up in such plush way. I had everything I always wanted. Everything was so easy. There's no way I can deal with the harshness of going forth. Yeah, it's too rough for me. I need a big, nice bed, you know, and I need kind of food all the time, morning, evening, whatever. I need all of this kind of entertainments and PlayStation. And actually, in those days, they didn't have PlayStation. But yeah, you know what it's like. <laughs> And so, you know, and so he says, no, I'm too soft to be able to go forth. Uh, yeah, that's basically what he's saying. Yeah. And, uh, you know, his softness is very famously captured in the story of the nutty, nutty cakes. This is the story Ajahn Brahma always tells, the nutty cakes. Uh, you know the story of the nutty cakes? Uh, yeah, some of you know the story of nutty. The nutty cakes is uh, Anuruddha, whenever he went to his mum, his mum would always have cakes for him, always be cakes ready. Yeah? Whenever he wanted a cake, his mum said, okay, here's a cake for you, Anuruddha. It was really spoiled, rotten, right? I, a mother should never give cakes to her child all the time. That's kind of bad parenting. But anyway, this, story, <laughs> this is not about parenting anyway. And, <laughs> and so she, he always had cakes, yeah? But one day there wasn't any cakes. And so she says to Naruda, nutty cakes. Nutty cakes means that there are no cakes. But he had never heard the word nutty before. So he thought nutty was a kind of cake. And so he says, yes, please, let's have the nutty cakes. <laughs> he never heard the nutty, the nut, so nutty, nothing becomes something. That's kind of the, the idea behind that story, yeah, is that we make something out of nothing. Yeah? And this is one of the problems in Buddhism very often. We, Buddha talks about ending and some, something ceasing, and create something out of out, something that actually is nothing. Just like Anuruddha created cakes out of no cakes. So. <laughs> And anyway, so he was, he was brought up in this way, really spoiled. He always had everything, never really had to worry about anything. So when Mahanama goes to him and says, why don't you go for it? He says, impossible. I'm just too, you know, I'm, I'm too kind of spoiled. And then Mahanama says to him, well, in that case, if you're not going forth, I will have to go forth. And you will have to look after all the household duties. And I really guess a bit worried. <laughs> What do you mean, household duties? What is this household duties about? Uh, you've never heard of household duties before. Uh, and so Mahanama tells him, well, the household duties mean that when the kind of early spring comes, you have to plow the fields. Uh, and after plowing the fields, you have to pull out all the rocks and kind of the bad things in the fields. Uh, and then when all the rocks are out, you have to till the field to make nice kind of you know, grooves and these kind of things in the field. Uh, and once you have tilled the field, you have to put the seeds in. Uh, and once the seeds are in, you have to uh, you have to irrigate the field there. Uh. And once the ir field is irrigated, you have to drain the field there. Uh. And when the field is drained, you have to pull out all the weeds. Uh. And when eventually all the crops come out, all the wheels are away, then you have to reap the field. You have to cut all the, you know, get all the grains or whatever. Uh. And then when you have got all that, you have to thresh it, uh, yeah, to get the grains out. Uh. After threshing it, you have to winnow it, to kind of get all the, the husk and things out of the way. Uh. And after winnowing it, when you have the grain, you have to store it in a silo or store it in a storehouse or whatever. And by the time you get it into the storehouse, the next season begins. <laughs> and Anurua says, but when does the work stop? And Manu said, the work never, never stops. Yeah? It just goes on and on and on from year to year. <laughs> and then he says, our fathers and grandfathers, 
they died and the work was still going on. Huh? Yeah. And then Anuda says, well, in that case, you go for it. I will go for it and you stay in the household life. So. <laughs> so, so he became a monk because he was kind of lazy. He didn't really want to do all this hard work. That is the Mahanama and Anuruddha story. Yeah. And yet he became a great monk, right? So you wonder, either the story is a bit dodgy, maybe not fully reliable. Usually stories are not fully reliable. That's why they are so fun, because they're not really reliable. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, uh, but anyway, so he became a great monk. Maybe he finally got inspired and he found time to his purpose in life by becoming a monk. Yeah. So, uh, so this is Mahanama, and this is why Mahanama is a lay follower. He's not actually a monk. Yeah. And this is also why he was in many ways a great lay follower. In some of the suttas, like the, uh, uh, what is it called? The uh, Chula Dukakanda Sutta, the shorter sutta on the a uh, heap of suffering, Majjhimanika 13 or 14, uh, where Mahanama is said to be a stream entry. Yeah? So he's gone a long, long way on the path. Uh, and so he, here he is talking to the Buddha. And what does he ask the Buddha? And this is what he asks the Buddha. Sir, when a noble disciple has reached the fruit and understood the instruction, what kind of meditation do they frequently practice? Yeah, so here he is basically saying that he is a noble person. He has reached a fruit. We often talk about you know, the, the fruit of arahanship or the fruit of stream entry. These are the kind of results of practice in the path all the way to the end. Who has understood the instruction? This does not mean just listening and understanding. This means understanding in an experiential way. You have experienced the Dhamma. So what kind of meditation do you practice Yeah, when you have this sort of... Uh, um, experience, when you finally have understood what the Dhamma is about. And uh, what meditation then, I've already told you what the six meditations coming up are, the six recollections. And of course, the reason why you can do those recollections if you are a stream enter is because you understood the Dhamma, you have fully reached the Dhamma, you know what the Buddha is. The Buddha is someone who has understood these teachings. And the teaching that comes from the Buddha are those particular teachings. So you know in your heart exactly what the Buddha is talking about. So when you recall the Buddha, you know what the, who the Buddha is. You know the qualities that he has, because you have seen exactly the same thing. So this is why Aryans are, have a special access to these kind of contemplations. And this is why the Aryans are here stated at the beginning to be practicing these things. And the same thing with Sila and with Chaga, with uh, morality and uh, generosity, yeah, as a stream mentor, you have completed these things, you have fulfilled these things, that's why you are a stream mentor. And so you are automatically virtuous, because you are virtuous automatically, um, you can gain very easy, easily joy from thinking about how you're living your life. And so this is the so this, these recollections are perfectly uh, made for the noble disciples, because they know exactly what these things mean. Uh, but that does not mean that we cannot do it. You know, one of the jobs of any person on the Buddhist path is to approximate the Aryas. We're trying to be a little bit like the Aryas. We're trying to be, we are semi-noble, yeah, semi-noble, partially noble. It's not found in this, that's just my, I'm just making that up. Uh, yeah, it's not, it doesn't exist. Uh, it's always nice to come up with some new words. Yeah, so you're not noble, but nor are you completely stupid either. Yeah, you are somewhere in between. So semi, semi-noble. And the Buddha often talks about when you practice the virtue in the good way, it is called the noble virtue. Yeah, these are the noble aspects of the path. So there's some truth to that. So that's kind of a nice way of thinking about it. And because you have a little bit of that nobility, because you're stretching to be like a stream enter, it means that you also have the ability to do these things to some extent. Yeah. And so our job is then to try to understand how can we try to see the Buddha. How can we understand the Dhamma in such a way that we have the same reaction as the stream enters, as the areas? So you can feel joy when you think about these things. How can we do this? And this is what I want to talk about today. This is what this is about today, how to approximate to that. So um, the Buddha says, when Mahanama, when a noble disciple has reached a fruit and understood the instructions, they're free frequently practice this kind of meditation. 
Firstly, the noble disciple recollects the, the realized one. And this is the Tathagata, the Buddha, in other words. This is the first of these recollections. So, um, we had a bit of a uh, technical hiccup there before, but uh, let's, anyway, let's just follow the, the schedule and do some meditation before we actually get into the details of this. Uh, <clears throat> okay, are there any uh, comments or questions so, so far? Uh, good morning, Ajay. Good morning. Um, I wanted to ask about yesterday's sutta. You were sharing about one of the vital conditions to be an ethical person. Mm. So I would like to understand um, does it mean that to be an ethical person, we have a responsibility to you know, to be proactive in our actions, to be virtuous? That means we don't have an excuse to be mediocre and just hide in a corner and you know without making any any contributions, without adding value to society. Do we have a responsibility to be ethical? Um, in that sense. Yeah, I, I, you know, the word responsibility is not the word that you find in the sutta as such. It's all about causes and effects. And so if you want to be happy, you've got to be ethical. That's what it says there. So it's not really, you know, responsible. I mean, responsibility is just a kind of it's one particular viewpoint, uh, in a sense. Uh, but I, this is more about in your, it's in your own self-interest and also in the interest of others as well, uh, that you are kind. Uh, so it's more about... Uh, what works, yeah? what makes the world go around, what kind of creates a good life for yourself and others. Uh, and to me, that's more powerful than responsibility. Responsibility kind of says, oh, you just have to do this because why? Well, because responsible. Uh, and okay, maybe, but you know, if it is for everyone's happiness, then I think that is a much power, more powerful motivation to be ethical than just to say you're responsible. Uh, and uh, so uh, that, that's what it comes down to. If you're not ethical, then uh, you feel bad about yourself. That's really kind of the uh, And also you're creating suffering for others at the same time. Uh, that is the real issue, I think, yeah. Is that answer okay? Is that, you happy with that? Yeah, okay. <laughs> is that a responsible answer? <laughs> 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 